Okay, here we are on the last day of our Northern Digital Storytelling Festival 2023. And what a ride we've had so far. We've had um, 10 days, 58 speaker sessions, um, and presentations, 20 panel discussions. Well, not quite 20, actually. We're on at number 18. 19, sorry, I can't count. That's a good job I'm not an accountant, isn't it? 19 panels discussions. <laughs> Um, and here we are on our last day and we're talking in this session about the future of digital storytelling and I have quite an interesting mix today. Um, you know how in this these sessions I've been trying to mix it up a bit with people from theatre and people from AR. Um, yeah, that's fine, Chris. Um, people from AR, um, we've got um, Sharon here who's going to talk a little bit about AI. Uh, we've got Chris Phillip here um, from Games Anglia and the BFI, who's going to talk around uh, games development, hopefully. Um, although I'm not quite sure, it's going to be a bit of a surprise um, in terms of your, to <laughs> your talks. So I'm looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. So I'm going to um, just do a little bit of housekeeping first. So the festival is free, it's online. Um, all of the sessions are recorded and are available on northerndigifest.co.uk. Uh, and there's a session recordings tab at the top so you can check everything out there after the festival there's an awful lot in there to digest um so you know have a cup of tea and a bun and enjoy over a period of time um and there's some great material in there for you to to look at um i especially recommend sessions 10 and 17 they're extremely good um so go and check them out if you if you're short on time those are the two to have a look at if you get a chance um, although I'm not, I'm not, shouldn't really be that preferential, should I? They were all excellent, actually. <laughs> I'm going to get into trouble for my speakers. Um, anyway, without further ado, uh, I'm going to briefly um, thank our sponsors, the Sign um, Network, Screen Industries Growth Network, for sponsoring the event, without which we couldn't have it. So a massive shout out to those guys. Thank you very much. Um, and let's get cracking. So first off, I'm going to in, uh, uh, introduce Robert Morgan, who is a writer, experienced designer, digital dramaturg, and founder of the uh, founder and creative director of AR Design Studio Playlines. Rob writes, designs award-winning AR and VR experiences, and has helped create story worlds and immersive experiences for some of the world's largest licenses, attractions, and cultural institutions. He is a pioneer of mixed reality theatre and has collaborated in some of the most critically acclaimed games in VR and interactive narrative. Rob wrote and voice directed A Fisherman's Tale, which was Game of the Year in the VR Awards 2019. Co wrote the 2012 augmented reality PlayStation game Wonder Book, Book of Spells, and its sequel, Book of Potions, and was content editor of the multi award winning mobile game 80 Days Times Game of the Year 2015. He has written a wide range of VR games and training projects, including conflict zone training for journalists and the world's first accredited VR business masterclass. Over to you, Rob. Good luck. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, it's incredibly awkward hearing my own bio. All right. Can you see my screen? And yeah. can you see uh, the slides? Yes. I do have a lot of tabs open. I have a system. I have a system. I've got one of those systems too. Don't worry. My, it's fine. My so we can see the screen. Kind of so many tabs open. All right, so hello, I'm Rob Morgan. I'm a writer, I'm an experienced designer. I'm a digital dramaturg, whatever that is. I actually worked in immersive theatre a fair bit as well. I was digital dramaturg on Dream Think Speaks show last year, and I'm doing the same role for the National Theatre of Malta later in the summer. I'm currently a visiting fellow at King's College, studying location-based digital narrative, and I started in the games industry. I was lead game writer at PlayStation for a while, worked on various uh, VR things, and yes, we're at the 2019 uh, VR Awards Game of the Year. We actually have a sequel for that coming out soon, so keep an eye out for that. But I have always been particularly interested in augmented reality. So back in the BPG era, that's before Pokemon Go, I started my studio, Playlines, and we make location-based layers of AR theatre and culture installations. And more and more my own work is about narrative design, dramaturgy for location-based technology and AR, because I'm interested in how we can use small amounts of digital narrative to just season people's ordinary experiences to change and recontextualize their relationships with the places and the people around them. 
Now, we're talking about the future of digital storytelling, and it's been a slightly funny week when it comes to the future of digital storytelling. So in the same week that we've learned that Disney and Microsoft and even Meta are slashing their metaverse departments and funding, we're also learning that Apple are probably going to be announcing the new Reality Pro headset at their conference in the summer. And note that this is not an image of that headset. It's a mock-up that's been doing the rounds for a couple of years. So we've been anticipating this headset for a long time. When Apple first started working on a headset, which is four or five years ago now, at the time, it was firmly in the realm of VR before Metaverse was even a thing. But it was VR because at the time that was the biggest news. But just like the hardware developments that are currently happening at Samsung and Google and again, even Meta, over the last few years, we've seen technology hardware development lines that were once billed as VR headsets that you put on and block out the real world, headsets that overwrite your senses, replace the real world with a virtual world. They're now being billed as XR or mixed reality or augmented reality headsets, headsets that can combine VR technology with the ability to let you see an augmented version of the real world. And I think there's several reasons for this. One thing to bear in mind, firstly, is that strictly speaking, the word metaverse never actually meant anything very specific. It meant different things to different people. It could mean whatever you wanted it to mean. And that's useful when you're using the word to go after investment and create hype. But it was a term of art used for investment and PR. It never denoted a specific type or structure or new development of technology which means it's then easy for the hype to reverse on a word like metaverse when people's varying ideas of what the metaverse could be don't materialize in the short term. Second reason is that it turns out that just because you build it, they don't necessarily come. Zuckerberg's vision was to create a new ecosystem, the scale of the internet itself, access to headsets where everyone went, everyone spent their money, and Meta took 30% of everything. It was a pre-colonized, pre-capitalized new world. But it turns out that's a hard sell because A, no other of the software giants are motivated to help you build your new monopoly or make their services compatible with it, and B, doesn't work when the new world you build is visibly inferior to existing formats out there like Second Life, a very old world now, or VR chat, which is actually fun. And thirdly, advertising. You can, in theory, sell virtual products in a VR-based metaverse. Fortnite is a metaverse, and it sells people virtual products all the time. But what changed the face of advertising a decade ago, transformed Google over the last two decades, really, into the monolith that it is today, was not control of content, but understanding of context. Advertising is more powerful when it's contextual and useful to you, personalized to you and aware of what you like and what you're looking at. If you're conjuring up a whole new verse, you can advertise to people in it, sure. You can put up billboards in a VR experience, but when the user is seeing and moving through their real world, the place where they express the most preferences, make the majority of their purchase decisions, there's much more potential for powerful new types of advertising that understand more of the user, understand their real world. And this is potentially very dystopian, don't get me wrong. We're, give, we're talking about giving users the ability to customize their own versions of reality and to be able to opt out of differing versions of reality that they don't want to see. The internet already empowers people to do this with, for example, the news that they consume. And I think the last decade or so has shown us very clearly the dangers of people being able to live in a self-affirming echo chamber version of the world that suits and confirms their prejudices. Augmenting reality is the promise of being able to leave each other notes in the margins of reality, but that makes it all the more important that we make sure these technologies are not used just to empower people who already get to customize reality to a great extent, and to make sure that we make these technologies available, accessible, and open to people who are already in the margins of society. There isn't a good answer to this, and it's possible that I and we might look back and think that we were part of the problem, like many of the internet's early developers now do. 
But if you get a philosopher drunk and you talk about this stuff, the philosopher will tell you that humans have always all lived in different versions of reality anyway, that one of the problems of life and language is that we can never fully explain to another person how we see and experience the world and why it constructs our beliefs and personalities. But I'm a narrative person, I'm a writer. And I believe that narrative stories are a tool that our species evolved in order to allow us to compare notes on our disparate experiences of reality, to be able to find common ground, not by describing exactly how we feel and why, but by narrating analogous emotive experiences that we can all find emotional resonance in. So I believe that the future of storytelling is the future of these technologies, good and bad. And I believe that telling stories with and about technology, especially as it starts to influence more and more of how we experience the world walking down the street, that that's the best way to remind ourselves that despite what our technology might allow us to believe, we have to share the world with one another. So, what is actually different about digital storytelling in augmented reality, mixed reality, XR? Uh, incidentally, I don't lose a lot of sleep over the difference between those terms. I've worked across them and I've jumped from buzzword to buzzword, sometimes even within the same meeting, depending on who I'm talking to. Other people uh, really want to nail those definitions down, but for my purposes, I've, I've swum across them in a way. And if you want to get into those definitions in a bit, let, let's do it, because I'm always keen to have that conversation. So, when you can't create a new virtual world around the player and instead you just season digital elements over reality, make your users' everyday experience of walking to the shops a bit more useful, a bit more entertaining, a bit more adventurous. Because in AR, mixed reality, whatever, 90% of the user's experience will be the real world. And so you have to collaborate with the real world in storytelling instead of trying to overwrite it or contradict it. You have to activate the user's imagination to change the way that they relate to the things around them. Get them telling a story about the way that they're relating to the world instead of trying to replace the world around them with your story. An example that I often give when I'm teaching is that in VR, VR is great at telling players things like you are in a dragon's cave. If you've got the time and the budget to build a really intricate, beautiful dragon's cave around the player, fantastic. You can put them in it in VR, that's what VR is for. But AR is not very good at telling the player you are in a dragon's cave. Because if you want to replace what they see with a dragon's cave, that's, you know, that's what VR is for. If you're trying to do that, that's not AR, that's VR with holes in it. VR is great at telling the player you are in a dragon's cave, but AR is fantastic at sneaking up to the player and whispering in their ear, so you're secretly a dragon. Because that changes their relationship to what they're seeing around them, it changes the way that they walk down the street. It's just a little bit of narrative seasoning over their experience of the world, which doesn't require you to overwrite or paint over the world. It just adjusts their relationship to the world around them in a more adventurous way. In AR, XR, mixed reality, what I'm drawn to is that typically the player and the protagonist is the same person. Every AR player is the protagonist of their own story. And it's important to remember that they are going to be experiencing the story as themselves or as a version of themselves which exists in the story. You're not getting them to control an avatar or role play a character that you tell them about. You need to be co-constructing an in-fiction identity with them, a version of themselves that lives in the story. And that means that even though we might refer to AR as an immersive technology, immersive in this sense does not mean blocking out the world around them or blocking out what's going on inside their heads. Because if the user themselves is the protagonist, if in story terms, their presence is diegetic, it belongs in the world of the story, then what's going on inside their head is also diegetic. It also belongs in the world of the story, including all those thoughts and emotions that we typically think of as being counter to immersion. In the immersive business, we tend to think of the audience member being self-conscious, for example, as the moment that their immersion breaks. 
academic writing about immersive experiences tends to talk about immersion in terms of being submerged or enclosed in the story. Like we become part of the story for the duration in a way that's all consuming. But I think that when we view the player's self-consciousness as the opposite of their immersion, we're missing an opportunity to play with the player as their whole authentic selves. And when I say self-consciousness, I'm talking about the boring stuff. Like when a part of their brain is thinking about how much their feet hurt or worrying about climate change or worried that they've left the oven on. Real everyday self-consciousness. It's not the enemy. It's a part of their world. And if you try to draw a line around it and say, no, that's not part of it. That's not part of the story. You're missing out on a chance to play with the player as their whole selves. And you often end up revealing that whether you realize it or not, you had a certain type of protagonist in mind when you designed your narrative and you end up alienating anyone who's different. Really what you're doing is excluding elements of the player from the story, cordoning parts of them off and saying, no, that's not part of it. But those boring, everyday, sore-footed elements of themselves are a big part of what makes their experiences feel real. Otherwise, I think what we end up doing is making immersion into this standard that we demand the audiences live up to. Often that means leaving some audience members feeling that maybe because they get distracted too easily or they're worried about being embarrassed or they're just failing to be submerged in the story, that they fail to live up to the experience when really it's often the experience that failed to be livable. You've got to collaborate with them. Now, luckily, we already have a word for this kind of self-aware, playful, mutual world building, and it's make-believe. Let's pretend, as we call it in rural Cumbria, where I grew up, or as I called it, I'll pretend, while the other lads play football. So very quickly, how do you actually tell good stories in this format? Well, I wanted to share three quick provocations for onboarding, which I think reflect this idea that self-consciousness can drive immersion and not fight it. Firstly, focus on augmenting the player, not the environment. In AR, any immersive technology, the most important reality you're augmenting is the player themselves. They're your canvas and your paint. Their willing engagement, even if it's not all consuming, is far more significant to their experience than all the set dressing you might be able to afford. And getting them to tell themselves a story about their role in what's going on, even if that's a small role, is much more cost effective than all the exposition and all the world building in the world. That means that no matter where or when your onboarding happens, remember that the story starts inside the player. The title of this talk is So You're Secretly a Dragon, because AR is no good at exposition. It's good at changing relationships. And the best way to do that is to begin your story by augmenting what's going on inside the player, making those realistic, everyday elements a part of it. And finally, in the nicest possible way, it's okay to ask your player to be an every person, to be a bit of a bystander in your story, because you, if you're taking a story out into the real world, if you're making digital narrative that takes place within the user's own world, you can't give them a big, muscular, heroic, empowering avatar that they're supposed to be within your story. They have to be mostly themselves but that affords you lots of ways to get them feeling heroic, whatever that means in the context of your story. Because stories are full of every people protagonists who get kidnapped or dragged into the story and then transform into heroes as a result of the events of the story, North by Northwest, for example. Even Star Wars is that kind of a narrative to find what's special within an otherwise every person perspective. Most immersive experiences are too big and complex to let the player take complete control over the narrative, but too often that results in narratives that try to pretend that the player isn't there, that they aren't making choices, or that those choices don't matter, but being an every person is a much bigger deal than being a non-entity, and it is a short step from being an every person to being a hero. That I think is what stories teach us. And that I think is what we need to keep hold of as we move into a space where our experience of everyday reality is gonna be more and more influenced by digital elements. I'm gonna leave it there, thank you very much.
Wow, thank you very much, Rob. That was amazing. What well, food for thought, just as we're having our first coffee of the, well, late morning. <laughs> Maybe you've had about 15 coffees by now. I'm still in number one. <laughs> that was excellent, Rob. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move swiftly on and we're going to have Q&A at the end, if that's all right. Are you okay, Chris, to go next? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for having No worries. I'm just, I'm just going to introduce you first, Chris, if that's okay. Is that all right? Cool. Great. Uh, so, Chris, Philip, Game Anglia and BFI International Development Fund. Uh, Chris is one of the founders and volunteer directors of Game Anglia, a non-for-profit company that helps young people and independent game developers in the east of England succeed in the game industries. In his day job, Chris serves the International Business Development Fund for the UK Global Screen Fund, where he works to help companies in the screen industries grow their presence and partnerships internationally. He has also worked as a game designer and product manager at a variety of games and tech companies. Over to you, Chris. Thank you so much. Um, and it's, yeah, thank you for having me. It's been uh, it's been really great to be to be invited and to be a part of this. And I have fifteen minutes of presentation on the future of storytelling. So at the moment, I am uh, diving in from the London Games Festival, where I have quite a lot of back-to-back -back meetings. Um, so thank you so much for for managing to. Uh, or managing to invite me to this. I do apologize if my sound is not as uh, is not as good as it would be, uh, but I am here for the Q&A and I'll answer any questions. Uh, for the organizing team, I'm more than happy to re-record this for the recording part of, uh, for the recording part of the presentation. So when are we when we are talking about um, the future of storytelling, I I sat down and I thought about what would be the best way to, to put these ideas through. So I, I came up with three ideas uh, that I want that I want to share with you. First of all, however, I will talk a little bit more about what I believe uh, puts me in a unique position to talk to you about the future of storytelling through these three ideas. My name is Chris Philip, uh, as Heather has mentioned, and I do agree with uh, with Robert that it is very cringy to have to hear your own uh, your own uh, bio. Being uh, being spelled out by somebody else, but I guess that that's that's part of growing, right? That's part of, uh, of being here. Um, I believe that I'm sitting at uh, that that throughout my career, I've I've sat at the the confluence of, of legacy and, and innovation. I have moved between the games industry and business support for all of the screen industries, for film, for immersive, for TV, for animation and not the least for which for, for games. So I have met over 150, probably close to 200 companies that were from the UK and they were looking to innovate and they were looking for funding and they were looking to grow. So these, uh, these ideas came from these discussions that I've had with them, from the, the issues that I have heard that they have, and also from the solutions that many of them have found. I also believe that I'm bringing a challenging mix into British culture, having come to the UK from uh, Romania back in 2011, at the time uh, at which cultural tensions against uh, against Eastern Europeans were growing. I have signed, uh, I, I then lived in Romania after I graduated uh, university for two years, and I signed a new work contract to come back to the UK uh, on the eve of the Brexit vote, and we all know how that went. Um, so that was that was an interesting time to come back into the UK, into rural UK specifically, and to try and make uh, make a career and make a name for myself. All the while immersing myself into a culture that I've now come to call my own as well. Um, and lastly, I've always championed community as a creative tool. Back in um, back in back when I was sixteen. I put together a group of people who are passionate about photography, and we uh, we got together and taught each other the sort of uh, photography theory that we didn't have access to in college or uh, at uh, in college or or uh, for free in Romania. We learned from each other, and we created quite a powerful community. One that ended up creating some really interesting um, installations and, and photo exhibitions uh, in, in Bucharest, and throughout. Throughout the years, I've taken this idea of community 
and really I have used it to the benefit of local communities and local industries. I have grown, and, and from that has grown the whole idea of Game Anglia and everything that we've been doing since 2017 to help young people get into the games industry and to help developers uh, understand that if they work together, they can share insights, they can share analysis, and they can um, they, they they can grow together and have successful businesses together. And we've been doing the same in one of my previous jobs at Creative UK. By um, and I've learned a lot from them from programs that they have created, like female founders, and from programs that I helped create, like Foundations for Screen, um, and and programs that uh, that I was involved in, like the Game Scale. So your voice will always be stronger as a community and you're always going to be able to work with others to achieve common goals. So the first idea that I want to, that I want to put forward to you is interactivity. And this feeds in from what Robert mentioned in that we are moving into, we are moving into a time where audiences and um, creators have grown up digital first and with, um, with access to the internet. Moreover, they've grown in a world where Fortnite, Minecraft, and other social multiplayer experiences are the default. Uh, they're the default of where people make friends. They're the default of where people socialize. And they're the default where we experience a range of other human emotions like falling in love, uh, being enraged and so on. So when you're looking at uh, when you're looking at how people are going to be interacting with your work, think beyond linear. It's quite hard coming from uh, for coming from a legacy culture where you go to university or you go to college and you learn that well this is film and this is how film has always worked. This is uh, TV and this is how TV has always worked to come back and to challenge that, to say, well, actually, no, because now we've moved beyond this idea of here's a film camera, go and do something. Oh, and you need to be down in London to have access to producers and to have access to capital. We've moved to a world where the Unreal Engine is free and open to everyone. Unity is free and open to anyone. And if you have time, which is the most precious resource, you're going to be able to create something that many people can, can enjoy. And we're growing up and building these in worlds where people are used to interact with anything that you put in front of them. That's why you have experiences like Punch Drunk and other immersive theater, which is going to be, uh, which, have been, um, which, which have been innovating and we, which have been innovating and where you have people who are going to, um, to spend a lot of money and a lot of time interacting with those experiences. We live in a world where, Net where Netflix has opened a um, games publishing arm of their company specifically to allow people to interact more with the Netflix brand. And also because they've realized that people want interactive content. So when you're looking at what can you do next, think about interactivity and how interactivity can play a part of the type of content that you, that you create. The second idea that I want to put forward with you, and this comes with, this comes with a warning that I like to call bullshit, uh, bullshit uh, word warning, is cross-media global universality. And this is the sort of thing that from what Robert mentioned, it sounds like it's right up his alley. Um, I thought, hey, this sounds like a thought leadership piece that I'm doing at the moment. And thank you, Heather, for inviting me. Um, but at the same time, I thought, hey, these are th this is a way of expressing something that I've seen come up and something that I really think is the future of putting, creating content out there, a storytelling content out there to be consumed by everyone. So cross-media focuses on a focus on intellectual property. I'm not necessarily going to mention the gigantic hits like the last of us, because that's, that's what my last two days have been about. But um, think about all of, the, all of the things that you create and all of the ideas that you come up with 
and how in this cross-connected world they can make sense, not just as a film or as a TV series or as a short or as an animation or a game, but how would they make sense as each of these and maybe beyond that as a podcast, as a music album, as a vinyl, all of those things are going to help you not only make your company and, and yourselves more sustainable, but also they're going to help this population that is starved for engaging with meaningful content to make sure that they engage with your ideas fully. Then there's the global universality aspect. And this is something that I've been learning a lot about over the last six months or so, uh, as I've, take, I've taken the post of International Business Development Manager for the UK Global Screen Fund. But it's something that I kept seeing with games as well, time and time again, from universal games that are, that are being played by billions of people out like World of Warcraft, uh, back, in the, back in the early 2000s to, to uh, Minecraft and to uh, Fortnite now, all the way through to Oscar award-winning uh, films that talk about family, like everything, everywhere, all, all at once. It's important to take a story, a universal story that speaks to everyone, and then try and figure out how you can get that story um, to as wide an audience as possible with uh, all the while preserving your national your ethnic, your unique character. So when you're looking at, uh, so when you're looking at the tools that we have available now, starting from something like putting a film up or a short up on Google Play Store, all the way through to the global marketplace that is uh, the Epic Game Store, the Steam stores, and everything in between, like Spotify, for example, it's important to understand that you can now make your content available globally, and there are tools, and this is where I plug AI because we are on a, on a, uh, on a panel about the future. There are, there are AI tools uh, that are free out there that can help you do things like translate content, uh, do things like help you understand what is global about your content, and then really help you publish that content globally to a global audience. You shouldn't have to be constrained in where exactly you publish your content. You should be able to publish it globally. And everybody out there in the world should have access to the great creativity that is inherent in this country and its creators. And the last aspect, um, and the last aspect that I would mention here is to keep in mind that um, is to keep in mind that you can work together with each other to create that content. And um, you should think about adding income generation to your toolbox and to the toolbox of your creators. Just quickly going back to cross media. This is also when I would like to plug the fact that together we are stronger than, individual, than individually. And this is where, and uh, I'm looking across the room, I see people here who have got together an IP owner and a game developer to create, to, to create something unique talk to each other. There are going to be networking events and that you have opportunities to forge new relationships, to start new companies and to create new content, putting together talents of two or more individuals or companies. So play nice and play together. And the last aspect that I will mention is income generation. And that's something where that when I was a student, I went to this game jam, uh, which is a, a 48 hour event where people get together in random teams and they make a game by the end of the, the time period. And I remember hearing somebody tell us, oh, you know, I'm, a, I'm an investor in, in mobile game companies and it would be great to, to invest in some of the ideas here because um, it's important to make money. And uh, as an investor, I like making money. I've made a lot of money in the past. He kept going on and on about how he only wanted to invest in commercial ideas. And I thought back then, this guy's not a very nice person. I'm a creator and I want to make games for the sake of making games and for the sake of making people happy. And here I am like 10 years later thinking, boy, 
did I not see the whole picture? Um, because when I'm looking now and many of the companies that, that I talked with, and even you know my, my own company, Game Anglia, a big part of that and a big part of what will keep companies back is the lack of access to income. And quite often, this holds you back from opportunities. It holds you back from creating what you really want to create. So when I say add income generating to your toolbox, I want you to think about how everything that you do also has a commercial aspect to it. And as creators, we don't like to talk to, about that quite often because we think that money is a... My, my experience has been that creators believe that money is uh, a dirty word. However, I have seen so many success cases of creators who are able to create something that was both profitable and uh, creatively interesting. And that's something that I want you to keep in mind. If you have a successful company that is, that, that is successful commercially, you will have enough time to be able to work on, on your passion projects as well. While, all the while being able to feed yourself and being able to employ others. And hopefully, my, my hope is for you is that you'll be able to have successful companies that are going to be more ethical than many of the other companies that we see out there, more profitable than many other companies that we see out, out there, and more creative than many of the other companies that we see out there. Thank you. That was great. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, and really appreciate that, especially considering you're in a room full of people and you're ducking and diving at the same time as as, as presenting in our festival. So I really do appreciate that. And and the, the 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 sound was a bit rubbish right at the beginning, but it came through after a couple of minutes. It seemed fine at this end. So so don't worry. Thank you for that. Great. Okay. God, I've got so much to think about already. Um, you know, just some really great sort of stuff coming through today and really amazing food for thought. Um, and we've already got questions coming through, so don't answer them yet. We'll wait till the end. We've got Sharon next, uh, and then we'll have a bit of a chat after that. So let me introduce you, Sharon. Apologies in advance for everyone who don't like, <laughs> who don't like being introduced. The reason I do it is because once we're detached from the present and it's on YouTube. Uh, it just means people watching the videos actually know who's doing the talk. So um, apologies if it's embarrassing and, and cringeable. I'll do it really fast. How's that? <laughs> With a very strong Scottish accent. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Okay, uh, so Sharon is an AI leader and ethicist, a founder and serial entrepreneur with a deep rooted passion for AI strategy and intellectual privacy. As a former IBM AI lead at Global Business Services UK, his speciality is transforming businesses into cognitive enterprises. He is the founder of OpenEthics.com and the CEO of AI Tech UK, delivering the national AI strategy and leading the development of an open AI ethics compliance platform with global partners and institutes. He is also the chief AI advisor for SMEs and deep tech startups looking to scale with cutting edge solutions. Sharon's mission is to disrupt the AI disruption and is an, a unite, a, a, an untiring advocate for the creative, innovative and ethical elements of intelligence technologies. As an accomplished public speaker, an AI ethicist and evangelist, Sharon promotes thought provoking ideas, shares his technical knowledge and advises on best practices. He has also produced a documentary about intellectual privacy, a concept he originated. Over to you, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. Can you see my screen? We can, yes, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Um, no, it's a it's an honor to share something that I'm absolutely passionate about. So I'm gonna bring a little twist to today's story or storytelling rather. Uh, so let's try to demystify AI as a technology and how that applies to the future of storytelling. So um, I'll skip the intro part, but I think I'll stop here for a quick story about my uh, career, if that's okay. Um, the reason is um, AI is actually, I would say, the most profound phenomenal and at, it's at the peak of the digital transformation pyramid, if you want to say. And since 2010, it has absolutely scaled in performance capability and we absolutely, you know, thrilled by the power of AI. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been having a really hard time to keep up with all the changes that's happening in the space of AI and regulatory changes. But I think 
for me, one thing that I, I could share is uh, my journey to AI began when I did the first cloud deployment in NHS back in 2015. Taking NHS data to cloud was not an easy task. And I was the pioneer in that space. Data processing, licensing cost half a million. When we put that on cloud, it cost 500 quid a month. So yeah, really powerful tech in, in a simplest form. Then we saw something very fascinating. There was pathways of patient that we could trace using data. Uh, we could see potentially which patient would cancel some of the appointments. And this is where the penny dropped because we were trying to use postcode, gender, their personal health issues to predict if they were attending appointment. And I think you can imagine what happens when you use personal data for that reason. And that's where the, the concept of ethics in AI really became prevalent. And I would like to emphasize a bit more on ethics in AI and in storytelling uh, probably today. I was also lucky to work with ICO, which is Information Commissioner's Office, and make one of the databases GDPR compliant before GDPR. And that was a great, great learning because we didn't understand what data privacy meant until GDPR was put in place. So, especially in creative industry, there's a whole host of things that we have to think from ethics, privacy, and also immersive and intellectual privacy, which we don't even factor when we talk about future digital transformation. So, first and foremost, um, I am, and along with many other speakers here, uh, it's an actual honor to share this space, but I think sometimes most of us are in this space. Uh, we are trying to pioneer a change. And you have this side of story where, hmm, why? Why should we bother? <laughs> and you know what? They're not wrong. They're absolutely right. Both the parties are absolutely right. So when we're trying to make a digital transformation or, or a digital change in existing practices, we are disrupting habits. We are creating insecurities. There's a bit of a threat uh, and fear of unknown. And also, will this change be too quick? Will there be threat to ex expertise, for example, or the investment that I've already made, right? So these are valid concerns that we need to factor when we disrupt the digital space, no matter where we go. So just be mindful that, you know, you might be thinking of, hey, I got the best wheel in the world, but does the user really want it? So I think just be mindful of that when we think about it. And today, I think the biggest question is, why should we really bother making that digital transformation or changing the way we do certain things in the future. So the simple answer to that is we have no choice. <laughs> um, we are surrounded by and proliferated with data that doesn't even exist. So Rob mentioned that he's working in AR, XR, metaverse space. That data actually doesn't exist, but we're generating that data. And there is data that exists. And there is other technology that couples with what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And intelligence is the new fashion. We want everything quick and easy. So we like to automate and we want to engage in a quick and easy and efficient manner. So communication and internet really helps. So all of this results into something absolutely inevitable, which we call uh, advanced integration. And the current version of advanced integration is AI. And that is industry 4.0. But I also say this is software 2.0. And imagine this as a technology flat out used in every industry out there, including how we build the new engagement, new communication, and new way of telling the story. So there is an AI rush, I would say, or AI race, or AI gold rush, whichever way you want to see it, every industry is impacting and maturing. This includes the digital transformation that the storytelling industry might face. And I'll touch base a bit on, on some of the scenarios uh, as well, how we can apply that. But what's fascinating to see is every industry is experimenting. So there are very few achievers, but there are many experimenters. 
So what it says, or what we can read from this particular uh, chart is, you have to try, you have to change, you have to adapt, otherwise we'll be left behind. So I think the one thing if we want to take away from this particular slide or uh, conversation is, try what's out there ethically and see if you can grow and experiment and figure out what works for you. Can you solve a problem that's relevant to you? And you should, you should also have the authority to do that. Um, what I mean by authority is, um, think about you as a storyteller. You have the authority to evaluate the right way to structure and tell a story. If I was to tell a story, about a topic which I'm not expert of, I don't have the authority to write the story or even analyze the story if AI even generated it. So there's that element of authority that you really need to honor and respect. Not everyone can be a storyteller or a lawyer or a doctor but just by using chat GPT. Okay. So just, just be mindful of that. But yeah, you have to take that leap of faith. If you have the authority, uh, just go and experiment. One quick way to do this is um, um, maybe let's look at the example that Rob mentioned. You could be in the immersive or virtual reality space and you could put something in, intelligent like a, use the chatbot, for example. We should be able to make a personalized story, remembering the user in the story or a character and really making it interactive uh, as an example that you've just seen here. Uh, but this is for pizza delivery, but imagine this in the context of really making the story interactive and adaptable. Uh, I often see, um, what's this, Bear Girls uh, documentary where you can interact and take two options. That's fascinating. And you can, you can really um, use some of these examples where you can make the whole engagement interactive with the uh, capability of AI. And to make it even more interactive, there are a few underlying technologies in the AI space um, where you can bring more intelligence in a visual capacity. If there are any documents that already exist or a storyline that you already written, you could really bring that into life by making those uh, integrations into whatever you're doing in the web space or in web three space or even in augmented or virtual reality space. But yeah, as you can see, there's elements of detecting faces, uh, able, ability to interact and link to other websites, understanding and adding value in your digital application. Now, this leads into a very interesting topic, the most uh, exciting topic out there, uh, which is generative AI. So what is generative AI? It's a type of AI technology that can produce various types of content, including text, image, audio, in fact, synthetic data. And current, current example is ChatGPT, DALI, which creates um, prompt-based images, and Bing AI also. Now, let's look at some example of what happens in generative space. So you could give a prompt or sketch, and it could come up with examples like this. Right? These examples don't exist. This is, I would say, the deep neural network uh, generative capabilities of uh, AI that has made all of these images from its generative capability. Now, on another prompt like astronaut on moon, based on the pose of Peaky Blinder, um, again, images like this didn't exist, but based on some simple prompt, these sort of images could be easily created. Variations of shoes, so you can see how generative AI is quite powerful and yet quite disruptive in terms of what you could do. Some of these designs are beyond imaginations or existing uh, models that's out there. And it goes on and on. It goes in interior design, it goes in costume design, and so on and so forth. And obviously gets into the space of art. Now, interesting thing is how do we apply this in real world and who has the who has the authority to apply this in real world. I want to share this quick example where uh, AI has been used in one of these video uh, clips and 
we can see what happens here. We're stuck on this stupid tower in the middle of nowhere. And I don't blame you. And now we're stuck on this stupid. Stuck on this stupid freaking tower in the middle of freaking nowhere. And it's all my fault. Now we're stuck on this. Yes, so we could do a lot of stuff uh, in this space. Now, one thing I appreciate Chris mentioned about copyrights and privacy. Um, that's important because if you think about that content that you just saw, maybe a company who took the video and the actor in that uh, video and the editor, these three people had the authority and rights to make that change. So it's, it's fairly ethical. Now, there are some content which is out there publicly, which has been used sometimes or abused rather. And that brings a lot of inherent dangerous stuff, which I often say we don't see with our naked eyes. But when that data is consumed, trained, and then AI spits those outputs out, that's when we say, wait a minute, I was not expecting this, but that's what we did. That's what the training data did. That's what out there, that's what's out there in the real world. So there is, this is a great example where if you just Googled unprofessional hair, it really showed uh, lots of, you know, African uh, people with uh, their hairstyle, which, which is the underlying bias that we see in the search engines. And this data is public. So imagine this data has been used to train some of those AI. You have an accountability to own the risk that it brings along with it. So just whenever we're trying to build something in, in this space, uh, just be mindful of the bias that could be there in the underlying data and what is your accountability. Now, another example is uh, if you were to use chat GPT to write a story. Now, I just did a quick Google, right? Write a story of a story of a girl alone in i don't know but like most of the images were scary and i was not looking for a scary image so if you are using chat gpt to write a story book for a girl who's alone it could come up with some stuff like this and it's our responsibility to manage that and put human in the loop and this is where the story writers or tellers they have that authority and responsibility to make sure that such things do not happen. So making sure, you know, AI is handled with caution is powerful, but you need to handle with caution. Um, I want to quickly close with a few magic words, which I often share with many people uh, when I give a talk. And that is, if you have to apply AI in your storytelling scope, think about these five words. Are you there to empower someone? With your story and technology are you there to create more engagement with ai as a technology then it's a good thing to do are you trying to enhance the experience or are you trying to optimize the existing way you're telling your story and lastly if you're telling story uh, using a webinar maybe there's a better way to tell the story so if ai has been used to transform and make things better yes that's one way to do it so you can see the power of technology in just transforming how the way the way you're going to tell the story and yeah as i said ai is quite powerful so uh, it should be used as a tool like a paintbrush or a typewriter to write your story and lastly i often say if you are building ai and machine learning with no ethics no conscious no moral codes we are building an animal so yeah again let's be responsible and let's build future storytelling with ethics at the heart of it. Thank you. Wow, powerful stuff. Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, gosh. <laughs> 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 wow, okay. So let's see um, what our audience think of all of that then. <laughs> sure. That was an amazing three um, uh, presentations. Really, thank, you know, really interesting food for thought. And lots to think about. Okay, I'm going to start with some questions. And so Olivia is is she she stay off the bat. Thank you, Olive. Um, hello, Robert. Is there an efficiency with 
is there an efficiency with that AR offers? Uh, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I've had a, a look. It's a good question. So recontextualizing stories is one thing that it could do, but could it improve functionality rather than just being an entertainment vehicle? Actually, that that's the thing that is already happening, more so than AR storytelling, which is tricky to get right. Uh, and we're still mm -hmm. working out how to do it. AR in industrial applications is already happening in a really big way. It's quite uh, significant, for example, in has a number of military applications. It's quite significant in the energy industry. If you need to examine the interior of a reactor or understand how you're going to fix it, being able to visualize the interior of something while you're outside it with a sort of a, an augmented X-ray onto the object, that sort of thing is already happening. And when you look at Apple, who are shortly going to release what's going to be an enterprise, very high level, probably three grand headset, it's partially so that people can start using those tools and start figuring out how to create advertising and entertainment applications for it. But it's partly for enterprise in the sense that a, a AR our visualization headset useful for commercial and industrial applications, those applications are already out in the world. Well, thank you. Um, okay, does AR open virtual connection with users or does it create a cyber isolation? I mean, I, I, I talked about AR, so I'll, I'll take this first, but lads, I'm curious what you think as well. Like, I mean, you could fairly ask this question about VR as well. I think that the fundamental point I want to make about AR is that because it allows us to customize reality, that ultimately might be up to the user and that is potentially a dangerous capability to give to the user to for them to be able to see the world in a custom way that they want to if you and i can walk down the street and look at the bus stop and that bus stop has an advert advert that is projected onto it by my system then it might be a political advert you might see a very different political advert on that same bus uh, stop at which point we're not really living in the same version of reality anymore. We might be having different versions of it uh, confirm, you know, uh, confirmed for us, different biases confirmed for us. So I think you look at how Pokemon Go launched and it created a massive groundswell. It created a critical mass. It made people want to get out because there was a visible community of fellow nerds. And there were too many people out doing this in the park for you to be heckled by jocks, the secret fear of every nerd. And that, that was a way that it created a, a play context, a digital play context laid across the real world that created massive connection. There are people who've met and continue to meet through these games by creating a playful dimension within the real world. It's a great way to get you out of the house and, and meeting real people and encountering the real world, which ultimately is a good thing, encountering difference, encountering others. Okay. Um, but it is possible that it will allow people to isolate themselves, not so much from the world, the way that VR does, but to isolate themselves from versions of the world that they don't want to see. Not a very cheerful answer. Oh, very interesting answer. Now, I think Chris has escaped, uh, but he did have his hand up, so um, not quite sure whether we should wait or move on. Maybe we'll move on and uh, we'll leave that one open for in case he has comments when he comes back. Okay, Sharon, should educational bodies teach how to make custom AI chatbots rather than use template software like Google Dialogue or Amazon Lexi? What do you reckon? Uh, there's easy way to do things. <laughs> there's a complex way of doing things. Um, I think you can use template one. One that I showed earlier was called Microsoft Bot Framework. So it has all sorts of initial piece to get things started. So, um, yes, I would say uh, if you want to build something quick and easy, uh, you can use the pre-built stuff. Uh, but it's always nice to know how to build it from scratch. But there's so many versions out there uh, that's already doing that job. So I wouldn't reinvent the wheel. Um, but, yeah, it's more about how can you add more interactions and intelligence behind that bot. If that That's where the fun lies so if you can make that bit from scratch that's that's interesting so cuts customizing chatbot capability is fun but yeah if you want to just get a shell yeah i wouldn't build this uh, the whole infrastructure from scratch okay cool hi chris you ran away but you had your hand up did you want to talk about the previous answer or yeah Okay. Yeah, just really quickly wanted to mention that one thing that we don't really we, we don't really talk about is the fact uh, well sorry AR is a tool 
right? And it's a tool in our toolbox, just as the internet is a tool, just as chat rooms are a tool. And I think when you're looking at you know, the power of the internet, it got us all closer together while at the same time creating the environment for like say, you know, far right, uh, far right bubbles. It, at the end of the day, it's a tool and it depends on how we use it. Something that I like to, that, that, that I really enjoy about a, uh, AR is the potential for accessibility and for opening things up to new audiences. So being able to walk down the street in Japan or China or any country where you don't speak the language and still orient yourself just by you know, scanning a sign or hopefully in the future using AR glasses is really, really great. And I think that is one of the, one of the potential uses, use cases for AR that I would like to see. On a personal basis, I would also love to see like AR glasses that give me turn-by-turn -turn navigation when I'm on a bike. Like I would love a real life mini map. You know, it's one of the things that I really miss about uh, the idea of Google glasses. That's all I wanted to say about that. Well, that's a really good point, actually. And for someone like me who has absolutely no sense of direction whatsoever, and actually got lost trying to get out of Leeds train station once, which is ridiculous. Um, something like that would be really, really, really useful <laughs> for me. So yeah, definitely. Okay, another question. Will countries release public guidelines for AI creation for companies and programmers? At the moment, AI is able to get away with stealing works and very little frameworks are put in place. Looks like it's my kind of question. Does it mean that yet? <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So there are plethora or abundance of published guidelines. So everyone is preaching, uh, thou shall not steal, <laughs> thou shall not uh, commit bias, and all sorts of stuff. Right. Now, the challenge is how do you translate this into actionable design? that's the biggest challenge so everyone is preaching left right center every country has their own ai strategy guideline every institute from alan turing to ico to eu to uh, california and whatnot everyone's everyone's publishing things and that's confusing as hell so if you ask a developer or a researcher go make an ethical ai product they were nowhere to start so <clears throat> open ethics well open ethics is the answer that we've been trying to research for the last few years, we use this as an education tool to help designers to think ethically when they're looking at certain things. So there's a valid point that Chris raised just now that, yeah, all the great stuff, it's, it's, it's amazing tool. Um, internet brought us together, but internet also did something dangerous. So I'm gonna, that's, I don't wanna sound like Luddite, but, I'm a tech for good guy and a tech evangelist, but internet also bought uh, Facebook, which resulted into various other things like Cambridge Analytica, political manipulations. And behind the scene, what happened, which we probably don't notice, is uh, data colonization, right? And the concept of public intelligence, which is a whole new topic, uh, which we didn't know, that data got colonized. So there was this data rush, right? Everyone's trying to just colonize or domesticate as much as data as possible. Now, the industry 4.0 is basically intellectual colonization. Basically, we're trying to colonize or domesticate or really get as much as intelligence as possible so that we can make a very powerful intelligence engine. And it's almost like releasing a gun out there in the real world so making a tool is great making a gun is okay you made the gun now you have two choices who who gets hold of this gun and then you have two choices who do you pull the trigger on and who has the authority to pull the trigger on so it's not about the tool tool is great i love it internet i love it i wear a badge <laughs> uh, that says i love it but it's what you do with it so there's no framework out there that embeds ethics, accountability, sustainability, risk evaluation. There's no 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 guideline that says do a full 360 degree risk assessment before you make your AI product. People just build it and ship it. So there's very limited interaction with the end users. I know there's a question that says, how do we bring elderly people involved in certain scenarios? No one's doing that. 
And that is essential when we launch some tools out there to do full accessibility, accountability, and risk assessment before it's out there in the real world with the real users. Mm -hmm. And who, who do you think is responsible for that though? Is it government? Is it the technology providers themselves? Is it the individual who's, you know, who's, who happens to be using that AI? Who, who is it that should, you know, be, be taking responsibility for this? Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it should be policymakers, right? But the problem is they are catching up with the change. They need to be advised. And at the same time, technologists, they have accountability not to publish tools which could lead into certain uh, unethical issues or risk it's like let's look into the plastic uh, as a innovation right we made plastic for 10 decades we loved it and we just shipped everything and made everything in plastic everywhere and then after two decades we were like oh there's plastic everywhere <laughs> right and waste management became government's problem right so council's headache not the manufacturer's headache we should have been the accountability right in a similar way when we're manufacturing stuff we are producing software like facebook google chat gpt tesla uh, they have accountability on the outcomes that it brings tesla is accountable for the accidents because it's their algorithm right if tesla sells tesla to uber they can't do that because uber hasn't got authority because they don't own taxis they subscribe to intelligence of taxi drivers. So these are the things they need to challenge and policymakers are very far behind. Mm -hmm. So what, what open ethics does is it really gives the power in the hands of people. You've got two choices now, good Facebook and ethical Facebook or bad Facebook, which one would you choose? So it's really showcasing uh, in a way that uh, people will want to go for and should have the power to choose the ethical software or product over unethical. Yeah, sorry, it's a long answer. That's all right. It's okay. It's good. It's, it's good to sort of like work through this in your mind, actually, anyway. So mm -hmm. it's good. Did you want to add something, Chris? No, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So, Robert, how long until we use AR more than we don't use AR? Yeah, it's an interesting question, Robbie. So I, I kind of want to in, interrogate the terms of the question a little bit. Like I want to ask you a couple of questions instead. So I think it's always worth asking the question, who do we mean by we in this case? Because William Gibson, the guy who wrote Neuromancer, the guy who invented the term cyberspace, he said that the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. I think one of the dangers of AR is that if it's affordable to some and accessible to some and not others, then there is a fundamentally different way of looking at the world, which will in some ways exacerbate an existing, not just digital divide, but divide between haves and have nots generally. If you can walk down the street and be informed in all kinds of ways, have your life be made more informative or useful, be advertised to in certain ways, but that's only if you can afford it. Yeah. then I think that that's a risk. So I don't know when we will use AR more than not using it because I think that we is a very slippery thing and it has a lot of ethics involved in even considering that question. Mm -hmm. Second question that I want to ask is how do you use your phone more than not using it? Because no matter how much time you spend on your phone, you have to sleep like you don't i think it's very rare even for the, the greatest of phone addicts that they would actually spend the majority of their day on their phone however the phone in their pocket is still massively influencing the way that they live their lives and so even if we're not talking about people wearing headsets that are imposing graphics on the world all the time i think it's a more relevant thing to think about how is the presence of ai in our lives going to change the way that we live our lives rather than asking how when are we going to get to a stage where we spend most of our lives in some kind of headset because i'm not convinced that's ever going to happen necessarily i'm not convinced we're always going to be wearing glasses that are always going to be imposing graphics on the world in a way that it completely changes how we see everything around us but even if it's off your face and in your pocket, those technologies change the way that you do things and relate to the world around you. 
how long until that happens, that is going to be different in different places and it's going to be different for different people. And there are lots of people who will never choose to live their lives that way. And there's not anything wrong with that. That doesn't make them, you know, a, a Luddite either, because there's nothing wrong with. It's a tricky one. I don't know. I, I project personally that we'll probably start to see really commercially viable glasses that can make significant graphical adjustments to the world that are consumer viable, probably in the next four to six years that would be my guess we have to solve some difficult technical problems first we have to solve the black pixel problem for example but if you want to imagine a world that's similar to ours but where these technologies have become a bit ubiquitous the example i always give is imagine being able to walk into a party and you can see floating above everybody's head their name and whether you've met them before and two facts about them that's a use case that everybody wants and that will simplify everybody's lives. But there's a big distance between here and there. And, you know, as we've been talking about, there are some scary aspects to having that technology be available anyway. In the meantime, glasses that can subtitle a conversation that you're having with somebody in a foreign language, Google was advertising that they're nearly there the last year. We'll probably see single use AR applications like that pretty soon. And some people may wear those all the time. In short, I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's all right. You're allowed to not know. <laughs> and, and Robbie came back saying that his, his idea of we is the general public or the every person, just, just so you know. That's, that's very fair. However, I think if anything, we're seeing that idea fragment, and I'm not sure that we can reliably speak about a general public. I mean, there's probably a tipping point that a technology historian could identify at the point where you could say that the general public would have a smartphone that that would be assumed for the average person a member of the general public when the member average member of the general public is wearing some sort of wearable that's augmenting the world around them i i don't want to make that prediction because i'm not sure it's helpful uh, yeah Fair enough. But, yeah but that technology itself is probably going to disrupt our definition of what the general public even is. Well, I mean, I could, you know, as a hard of hearing person, the idea of having glasses that I, cause it's very isolating. You know, if you go to a pub or anything like that, it's extremely loud and you, you have a very difficult time understanding what anyone's saying. The idea of having glasses that's giving you captioning, mm -hmm. that's telling you what everyone is saying. I mean, you know, that's as useful as my hearing aids. Yeah. You know? So that kind of thing sounds great. You know, but on the other hand, you know, I don't want to walk around with being having adverts flying in my face all day long. So I think the single use one sounds interesting, right? Oh, I'm going to go to the pub tonight with my friends. I'll put my glasses on. I'll understand what everyone's saying. But yeah. Yeah. And get the interest. So I get the interesting insights of the two things that, that you're going to have floating over the tops of their heads, which could, be, <laughs> could open a whole can of worms entirely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having a little joke to myself. Okay, uh, Chris, what is the relationship between interactivity and agency? Um, just wanted to say, uh, Robert, if you're ever kickstarting the AR glasses that tell you if you've met someone before and where, I would totally sink money into that. I am horrible at remembering names. Uh, the, the names of people and they're like, we maybe before I'm like, ah, oh, hey, person. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, 100%, that would be, that, that would be something that would change a lot of my professional life. Uh, going back to the question at hand, what's the relationship between interactivity and agency? I think, first of all, we need to define each of these where the way that I see agency is the ability of a player to make their will reality. Um, and the interactivity as being the, the ability to affect something within uh, within the form of, of media and have uh, and have an outcome, even if it's not necessarily the desired outcome. So if we, but, but that, that outcome should be significant, where significant means that you have affected something, you have changed. Um, the reason why, the, the reason why I feel to qualify the word interactive is because there is a discussion uh, around VR at the moment and immersive around what exactly is interactive immersive and what is simply linear immersive. Um, and if you, yeah, uh, that, that, that's why I feel the need to qualify. 
So then when you're looking at the relationship between interactivity and agency, this sounds like a very good, uh, a, a very good um, bachelor's team or, or master's team. Um, my two cents looking at it at the moment is that players will do things that you did not intend them to do. We see this going all the way back to some of the old school games, like, like um, I believe it was Doom, where you had uh, a rocket jump, where people realized that if, a, if they aimed uh, a weapon in the game, a rocket launcher at the ground and, sh and uh, shot it, just after they had pressed jump, they were able to essentially do a double jump. Uh, so get a lot higher than, than otherwise. So that's unintended be behavior and it is players um, showing their ages within, but everything is still within the confines of the game, the confines of the system. And from that point of view, it's quite important that us as, as game developers design things which allow the player to experience a wide, uh, a wide range of um, emotions that allow the player to experience a wide range of, of options. Um, something that I that I keep seeing, especially when you're looking at um, at many of the best-selling games, is the fact that if you have a hammer, everything is going to look like a nail. If the only thing that you can do in a game is shoot or stab people and and uh, and use traversal abilities like moving and jumping, then all of your expression is contained within those verbs. You know, shoot, stab, throw jump so what other verbs can we as people make available to players can we as designers make available to players? and there are some really interesting games out there um, and other forms of media which have um which have really pushed the boundaries of this. and one of them um, that i cannot remember the name of at the moment again you know really bad with names also qualifies with game names um, you are essentially writing letters for other players. And these are letters that um, go through a moderation uh, phase to make sure that they don't contain profanity and things like that. But that's the only way that you can interact in this essentially multiplayer games. You receive letters, random letters from other players. You send letters to other, to other random players. So the act, the verb is write and send a letter. So. That, I believe that game was BAFTA Award winning or BAFTA Award nominated last year or two years ago because it came out during the pandemic when I feel like it, it struck a chord with quite a few of us. Um, and I think it's called Kind Words. I'm not entirely sure. Um, and so when you're looking at that at, at agency and at, at, that interactive and the interactivity, what we can do as game developers is define interesting spaces and interest in, and give the players interesting verbs to play around with and then allow them to express their agency and their free will within within those spaces and those spaces can be inside of a game that you play on your playstation they can be inside of your phone in the real world by creating a pervasive game like pokemon go or they could be something else that we we may not have uh, necessarily thought about yet i mean when you're looking at games, we also have to remember that sports are games, right? And speaking of player agency, compare a football game from the 70s to a football, football game from 2020 and have a look at how different the players interact as they realize that the rules of the game permit them to dive, you know, when, you, when you're looking at it that way. Again, it's all about like verbs and about what the player, what we allow the player to do and then expect that they are going to be a bit mischievous. <laughs> Absolutely. It reminds me of the uh, conversation with Bright Black last week when they created a VR room and they put loads of props in it and there was a little broken window in the corner and apparently everyone, every, uh, every uh, gamer that went in that room took all of the props and chucked them out the window because <laughs> <that, laughs> that's what they wanted to do you know because that's what you do when you're little you just post things through um and that's what that's what they gave them a full agency and that's what they uh they ended up doing they didn't play the game at all okay um one for you sharon is there a times or are there times in scenarios where we shouldn't use ai uh yes uh especially when that decision could lead into high risk. Um, like 
surgery or you are making uh, I don't know robotic soldiers or sometimes travelers taxis or cars for example if they're going on a motorway at high speed so there is an element of risk so that you've got to have some sort of human uh, element to it and if we haven't explored all the outcomes or tested this in a pilot you can't just take high risk innovation from idea build a prototype prototype works in my factory let's just ship it onto the main road no um there are steps to deploy ai as well so yeah i, I would say think about the risk if this goes wrong what are the risk if the predictions of say drugs goes wrong what are the risk so yeah just make be mindful of those uh, scenarios if the risk is low in this kind of scenario storytelling mm -hmm. if you're not gonna emotionally or psychologically uh, disrupt anyone then it's okay you know the risk is low in terms of giving ai some elements of autonomy of autonomy mm -hmm. always best to have human in the loop and use AI as an augmentation tool. Yeah, that's yeah, just to be on safe side. Yeah, yeah. Just a quickie, uh, Chris had to shoot. Uh, he did leave a little message saying thank you very much to everyone and also kind of be introduced uh, for a chat afterwards. So I'll, I'll, if you guys are happy, I'll do a bit of an introduction. Um, but yeah, he had to shoot off. So uh, he didn't just disappear without saying goodbye. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for that, Sharon. Um, no uh, what else have we got here? Let's have a look. How do you, oh no, that one's for Chris um oh here we go this is a little personal one for you robert why did you get into ar storytelling um so uh a little bit of right place right time so i uh worked at playstation i started as an editor worked my way up to uh, a lead game writer on a, a license at the time it was the biggest license in the world um and there was a moment when i was testing um an early version of an AR experience. It was a, it was called Wonderbook. It's a cardboard book that came in the box and you sat in front of your TV, sat in front of your PlayStation camera. You could see yourself, you were on the camera feed. You could see yourself sitting in your living room with a, with a cardboard book. And the only thing that we could graphically affect was the book because the book was covered in markers, like a QR code that the camera could understand. And so then in the live feed, as you saw yourself, we were able to put graphics onto the book and turn it into a magical spell book. Um, and it struck me when I was watching kids encounter this for the first time, that for all that it was incredibly difficult and counterintuitive to instruct them how to use this thing, that there was a moment that I realized that they were seeing themselves inside the fiction. They'd become their own protagonist. It didn't require them to be controlling an avatar in order to be part of the story. And it didn't require them to be inside of like what, particularly at the time, this is like 12 years ago, the games industry was mostly making games about the same muscular brown hairs with a dead girlfriend that we'd been seeing previously. And even, you know, now things are much, much better in terms of the, the range of people that you see represented inside games. But the fact that you could see, kids could see themselves and that they could go and they could put on their wizard hat and robe, but they'd be themselves. It struck me as this incredibly difficult storytelling challenge to make narratives that worked with a central character that you had very little control over because they're themselves and they live in reality and they know how reality works. They know the rules Then you can't impose rules upon them from the outside, except by making them want to be part of a story that gives them certain parameters for adventure. And I found that really inspiring because it was going to be so difficult as much as anything else. And so I got the chance to see that sort of thing early and I just wanted to be in it ever since. And so I, when I founded my company, it was making audio immersive, like augmented reality theater without any graphics or glasses at all, just by placing the audio into locative spaces, like triggered by location beacons or GPS and then real world actors. You might even define that as not AR if you really want to. I never lost much sleep over that. But I wanted to be building a track record of ways that you could lay a layer of digital narrative over a real place. Mm -hmm. 
because it was clear to me that sooner or later it was going to be possible to walk down the street and completely reskin the street in a different way. And I wanted to figure out how to make that emotive and try to make stories that are based in empathy rather than based in this risk that people can choose to see reality in the way that they want. And I love the idea of the AR sprinkles as well, you know, just that, you know, just enough seasoning to to kind of release the magic. I do it's, it's a really lovely concept, actually. I, I think a big influence is that I was a theatre kid rather than a film student. And I was, when talking to people about VR and AR, a lot of people come from film thinking that it'll be analogous. And in fact, theatre is way more helpful when thinking about narrative, both for AR and VR, because you can't control the camera. You can't control the user. And theatre has to be made in reality and it relies on a massive amount of suspension of disbelief. Theatre is not particularly convincing. It's not going to fool anybody. That doesn't prevent people from getting caught up in the narrative. And I always had a lot of affection for those forms of storytelling because I think they're interesting and I like collaborating with the audience, getting them to tell themselves a story because ultimately, as far as they're concerned, that's going to be better than any story that you can download to them. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. And that sounds like a lovely place to stop, actually. Um, so thank you very much, guys, for that. That was really, really interesting. Um, and every time we have one of these sessions, it's like, how could it get any better? And then it does, you know, and you guys come through and, and come up with some really fantastic uh, conversations. So I really appreciate your time um, and making the effort to, to put the presentations together. They've all been really excellent. So thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you to our audience, especially Robbie and Olive. Um, you guys are amazing and have been throughout the entire festival. Your questions have been really interesting and thought provoking. Um, and I've saved these guys from my rubbish questions. So, um, you know, so thank you very much <laughs> for, um, for coming up with questions and being so engaged in the sessions. Um, and thank you finally to our sponsor, Sign the Screen Industries Growth Network, uh, for sponsoring the event today. So just before I go, um, tonight is our last uh, session, the building blocks of story. And this is where I hand over the reins to another chair for a change for the first time in the entire festival and have a wee rest. Um, and so Roxy McKenna from Film Hub North will be having a chat with two script writers, um, Roger Hyams and Beth McCann. And they'll be talking about the building blocks of story. So back to the trad um, after this whirlwind tour around um, AR, AI, um, VR, uh, and all the other things that we've we've talked about transmedia um, over the last couple of weeks. So please join us for that if you can. It's at six o'clock this evening. You can book your tickets on northerndigifest.co.uk. Um, you can see this session afterwards again on the same website um, as, along with all of the other sessions. So please check them out. Um, and I think that's us. You can now go and get your lunch and, and relax for the afternoon. So thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate it. Have a good day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, guys.